welcome. We made it. It's really good to be together again, isn't it? Face to face, instead of seeing through a glass darkly, as the Zoom has been for such a long time. It's a very special occasion for the History Society. In particular, it's very good to see David Vaughan here tonight, whose idea it was to begin the History Society all those years ago, ten years ago. So thank you, David, for keeping me so busy in my retirement. <laughs> uh, there will be time for several thank yous at the end of the evening. But before we begin, I just wanted to make a brief comment about the performers here tonight. It's been a rather difficult few weeks as a number of performers, both singers and speakers, have had to pull out for very good reasons. But we've sold it on. Uh, Alan here in the choir have learned new songs in a matter of weeks and speakers have taken on completely new roles at the drop of a hat some just a few days ago. So if you think my hair looked particularly grey. <laughs> <laughs> now at the interval, uh, refreshments will be brought to you. We're not forbidding you to go to the loo. Uh, there is a loo available for you. But um, if you are able to stay in your seat, refreshments will be brought to you. Now in your programme, uh, not only do you have the song sheet, which you will be asked to use in the second half of the evening, but there's also a nap here. And the idea is that when sandwiches are brought to you, you'll hold out your napkin and the sandwiches will be placed in it. You <laughs> have to do risk assessments, you see. It will be a bit complicated. Um, before you leave tonight, you might like to have a look at a very small display at the back of the church um, with a few details about what the History Society has been up to in the last 10 years. And there are some of our booklets about different buildings in the uh, village, uh, which you are very free, uh, uh, able to take free of charge this evening um, on us. So, the show is about to begin, but not before you have all switched off your mobile phones. We hope you'll enjoy the evening. Norman 6. 
still, we had a little wooden church, and we were much more important than that fancy Kenilworth place. Ah, <laughs> Pete days. We spent most time in the fields, plowing the strips of our oxen, or grazing the stock, or cutting the wood, or digging out the stone from Moxlow. Warm work, you know that was. But the weather was warmer in those days. Talking of Moxlow, that's where we went when we had any grievances. Took them to the court there and got everything sorted out. I and while we were waiting for judgment, we had a fine view too. And then came the monks. Ah, 
swiftly on to Edinburgh. Till 1536, the time came for the monks to go. When King Henry VIII's commissioners visited Balmuni Abbey, they noted that there were only 11 there, including the abbot, Thomas Tutbury, who was pensioned off. But what about those stony people who worked at the abbey? 46 of them, including two dairy women. Times would have been very hard. No pensions for them. But let's not be gloomy. By this time, most of this lovely church had been built, and we can see all around us what fantastic workmanship went into it. Don't run away with the idea that stony folk were just peasants. You surely had to be a master mathematician and mason to create this amazing arch. Well, it, <coughs> it was a time of great wealth. The Coventry Mystery Place, just up the road, was celebrated throughout the land, telling the stories from the Bible. They were performed by the trade guilds, which made the city rich. It was the fourth greatest city in the whole country. Coventry grew rich on cloth and dye. Those sheep farming monks had no doubt played their part, and Stoney was well known for its part in the trade as well. That's people like me you are talking about, isn't it? Give it the name, one of the fullers in the village. Did you know about us? The cloth makers of Coventry knew us, though you might not. You might turn your nose up now. Everyone in Stoney was involved. I'll spell it out. Fully means we. We! Yes, we. Collected in great pots from every house, then used in the fulling process. I won't go into detail, you can ask me later. But the lovely cloth from Coventry couldn't have been made without Stoney weed. <laughs> Perhaps, well, let's look out today for Mr. Collins. Stoney then, rich or poor, may well have heard one of the greatest pieces of music from the country days at this time, and we still sing it today in the Stoney building. Leave family. 
finally arrived. <laughs> I was once thought about London. Oh, oh. 
I'm sure of it, my Lord. I'm sure of it. But quite apart from the Abbey, what about the goings on here in the village in those days? Oh, Reverend Edward Monsell here. I came to Stoney in 1632, and the registers quite rightly began shortly afterwards. I'm a Cambridge man, by the way, Emmanuel College, and I was granted Stoney because I was a chaplain of King Charles. Yes, and we all know what happened to us because of that, don't we? Don't we? Very well, yes. Here's the story, if you don't know. It was 1643. I was preaching here in this church when perhaps because it was known that I was a king's man, the roundheads decided to make their presence felt. And 
some money went to charity. We paid the bell ringers, of course. Yay! And the woman who washed the bigger surplus. But perhaps the most interesting glimpse we get into stony life from these cows is the pest control bill. The church wardens paid for catching crows, magpies, jays, sparrows, foxes, badgers, moles, otters, polecats, and urchins. Urchins? Fear not, urchin was the word for hedgehogs. They killed hedgehogs! Oh, yes. <coughs> Horrible birdie. Some say they steal milk from the cow's udders. Some say they're witches in disguise. I'm Widow Burberry from Vicarage Road. I caught five hedgehogs, the most of anybody. And was paid tuppence, tuppence each. Well, there we go, Widow. See, I'm different from me. <laughs> I'm champion fox killer. <laughs> Champion fox killer here, Robert Hudson. Oh, four, two. Six I caught that year. Six. I was paid six and three altogether. And at the other end of the social scale. <laughs> And other 
good cause. It was quite a day when the Duchess was buried here. People came from miles around. She'd been brought all the way from London and left gifts to all who met her on the road. We talked of giving. She gave so much money to this church, it was a real blessing. And don't forget her daughter Catherine. She was a great giver too. And she founded the almshouses in Temple Balsam, the Lady Catherine Leveson. Our Duchess is well remembered. But some stories, sadly, are forgotten. What did Joyce Parkley do, for example? to earn such a magnificent box to them in the churchyard just on the other side of the South Isle here. She died in 1679 and the inscription says, Here lieth the body of Mrs. Joyce Hartley, whose fidelity in the late troublesome times to the Honourable Lord Lee and his lady was very remarkable. What did she do in the world?
Let me see you sitting up straight, me no shuffling <laughs> or slouching. <coughs> Good. That's better. Now we know where we are, I trust. My name is Gardner. John Gardner, the first schoolmaster of Stony. <laughs> I heard you talking about those who helped the village. All well and good. Have you forgotten the workhouse? <laughs> what could be a more satisfactory answer as a commune to a community of paupers than a nice big workhouse? You're quite right, sir. John Salem here, overseer of the poor. We could see that some of the stony folk were how shall I put it? Dirty. <laughs> yes, yes, I say so. Some know better than they ought. You might call them the undeserving poor, but we, my fellows here, could see the need for a special house where they could be given shelter and uh, maybe, maybe some work. And so we wrote to the Lees, saying we would put up £200 ourselves towards it through the parish rates and the rest was paid for the leads, and Wentworth House was built. Of course, it wasn't called that then, it was just a workhouse, but it kept going for a good many years, I reckon into the early part of the 19th century. More was the pity, kept our noses to the grindstone, and some of the old ones died there. <laughs> Remember some of those paupers we lived with? William Barton, with his terrible rheumatism, and poor old Sam Turner, the carpenter, with his leg broken so bad that he couldn't work. Mrs. Pritchard and Widow Smith, who were so unclean they couldn't be lodged elsewhere. And little Harriet Sammons, only five years old, we had nobody else in the world, so went off to be boarded with Thomas Claridge. Hmm. Well, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. It was the 1780s when the workhouse was built by the kind generosity of the Lees. But almost half a century before that they had built our lovely school. Such a benefit to the community and most tasteful living accommodation for the schoolmaster and mistress. Keep you back straight. <laughs> I've got my eye on you. Oh, don't talk to me about building. Mess and noise everywhere for years. Masons, carpenters, blazers, they were never still. So what's the problem with that that? There was work, wasn't there? True, true. It all began when they wanted a new west wing of the Abbey. Went on for 20 odd years, that did. Enormous. And then they built the schoolhouse, then the parsonage next to the church, then the workhouse. But the biggest change of all was right here in this church. At the same time as they built the new river bridge at the Abbey, caused all sorts of ructions, it did. <laughs> yes, yes, all right. But there was such a lot of work done here. New pews, new south aisle, blocked up the door out that way, did lots of repairs. But still, Stony was, first of all, a place for farming.
Shakespearean recitations from that famous actress, Fanny Kemble. <laughs> <laughs> Actually. <laughs> Remember the swan in we talked about earlier? Well, that was got rid of and replaced by new buildings. That's when they built the cottages next to the club too. Lovely building it was, and many improvements made over time. The coach house next to it was made into a smoking room with a billiard table and bagatelle. By 1882, it was made even bigger and could hold 300 people. <laughs> the only thing was, the family were great believers in temperance and wouldn't allow alcohol there till after the year 1900. Even after that, you could only buy two pints of beer or two pints of stout. No spirits or wine was the pity. <laughs> so now we're well into the middle of the 19th century. And from now on, there's more information about people who live here before us than can be told in a month of Sundays. We can look at the censuses. We can look at the parish registers. We can look at gravestones in the church yard. But what we have extended is more precious and helpful than many other villages of the time. The notebooks of Lord Lee and his brother the vicar. Each in his way documented every individual in the village and every house. It's a fantastic amount of information. So, for example, the vicar made a page in his diary for every household and wrote about them. George Atkin, two bank cottages, labourer, wife Phoebe, children Henry, Arthur, Joseph and Jane. Mrs Atkin broke two ribs in June by falling over a chair. Steady and industrious woman. Arthur was very ill in July and again in November and met with an accident to <coughs> his death. John Gould, right inside Georgian Street, carrier and sexton, wife Caroline. Children, John, William, Elizabeth, Edward, Hannah, Henry, Robert, Louisa, Caroline, Francis and Joseph. <laughs> Side of Meridian Street, Kirkland's Court, gardener and seedsman, and foreman of the roads, wife Sarah, children Hannah and Mary, William's brother James is in the arms house. Mrs. Mitchell had scarlet fever in July and August. Hannah went as a pupil to teacher, uh, sorry, pupil teacher to Whitehall's College, Chelsea having obtained a first-class <laughs> Miss Benjamin French, Coventry Road Philly, tenant of Mr. Bromley's and a manufacturer. Two sisters live with him. He's a non-conformist. <laughs> By contrast, Lord Lee went round every house in the village, noting down what repairs he needed to each one <clears throat> and how many people were living there. William Worrell, Jr. Seven children at home. Three bedrooms, a good cottage, but needs a new privy. James Buswell, Sadler. Three bedrooms, two children, good cottage and shop. Widow Flowers, 86 years old. Two bedrooms, a son and son's wife at home. Chimney has been mended and windows re -leaded. Mrs. Hall, wife of a son of Thomas Hall, who has deserted her and gone to America, leaving her with two children at Stoney. George Harris, three bedrooms, seven children at home, 
good cottage, but very dirty. And so on, page after page, from the 1850s to the 1890s. A unique glimpse into the ordinary folk of Stone Village. Two more stone people have left their mark on history. One is a historian herself, Mary Dorma Harris lived at the Dale House and came from a family of farmers who lived both there and at the Dial House. She wrote extensively about Warwickshire's villages and the city of Coventry, but her heart belonged firmly to Stoneley. Uh, now I'm old, <clears throat> the, new, the cottage still looked very much as they did when I was a child. But the Timber Manor House, with three gables at the far end of the village, and used to be covered in ivy. But now it's just black timbers, as stands revealed. Inside is a fine oak panelled room, and another city room has a chimney and inglework big enough to house all the children of the old woman who lived in a shoe. <laughs> I remember the place when I was a child, and the lady who lived mistress there, her face was a network of wrinkles topped off by a round cap with bow ribbons. Her old hands, I remember, were folded over a black silk ribbon, apron. She kept pink and white sugar biscuits ready for visitors in a cupboard by the ingle nook for me. And I guess the other one you'll be needing is me, Edward Langley Farden. My family carried on living amongst you stone folk till well into the 21st century. My fame, such as it was, was that I invented the modern bicycle. Yes, I was a Mr. Blacksmith and heating engineer, and I'd worked for the Rothschild family in Switzerland before Lord Lee asked me to move here. I made these ornamental gates at the Abbey, and much more beside. But I fitted the iron bicycle with rubber tyres, and built a suspension wheel for it, rode it all over Warwickshire, and drew crowds in Coventry. They wanted me to patent it, but I wasn't keen on that. So others took the credit. I was happy tending the flowers in my garden, in Church Lane in my later years, and that fellow Starley, well, he was the one who got the statue in the town. Don't you hear the truth? 
front of feet, Dolly Gray. Sounding through the village street, Dolly Gray. Tis the trap of soldiers too in their uniforms of blue. I must say goodbye to you. Plenty to keep me busy during the war. And at its end, 
end, my subtask was to think of how to honour the 13 young men, some only boys really, who had died. You can see their names up there. Many died in France. Three were killed in the space of two days of use. Two on the song. Two more at Gallipoli. And others at Salonica. Those who returned looked like shadows of their former selves. Life changed for us all. <coughs>
the Americans came to the deer park. And just in case you've forgotten, in 1943, it was a hospital unit to return the men to fighting fitness. They did that all right. Oh, but the Americans, they were so handsome. <laughs> and there was also a theatre and picture shows and dances. They had a band too that came and played in the village hall. We had a fine old time, didn't we? True, some of the men had been badly injured, but they did all sorts of PE and exercise. Ooh. Even Joe, Frank, Joe Lewis, the boxer, came over and refereed a boxing match. He was so miserable when they all went home. Still, we had lots of good parties when the war was finally over, didn't we? And more families came into the village, so we made new friends, and there were so many events at the village hall. There was dance bands, plays, whist drives, concerts. We put on everything. Happy days. In a flash, we arrived at a time within living memory. Matthew Ferguson arrived. The Royal Show came. Many new houses were Decades after the war saw huge positive change. But sadly, the school had to close. Perhaps the biggest change of all came in 1979 when Lord Lee died. Such a lovely man. What with death duties and the Abbey trying to cope up that terrible fire in 1960, the new Lord Lee had to break up the estate. And so all were sold, including the Abbey. The Lees themselves moved away, and Stoney became a very different place. All the same, our community life still flourishes. We bought the club for ourselves, a great place for everyone. Events every week, and Christmas parties for the children, the duck race in the summer. And the village hall is there for all sorts of occasions. And we have the field for sports. Busy teams care for the church and the churchyard. And these beautiful Georgian pews have been made even more lovely by the stone stitchers' cushions. And the meadows have been preserved for everyone. And the community orchard produces cider every year. <laughs> there are so many groups to join, such as the choir. <laughs>
the night. What? What? <laughs> oh, I thought I'd been dreaming. I did hear some of it, yes, but I couldn't make much sense of it. Lords and ladies and schools and Oz, Oz Australians reckons it's time to take a stroll up Moxlow Hill before nightfall. Always cheers me up. Great views, you know. Some things never change. Goodbye, Paul. Goodbye.